people often ask how to bring the practice into daily life. And the answer is relatively simple. It's one many people don't like to hear, but it is simple. Restraint. There are basically two kinds of restraint. There's restraint in what you do, and restraint in how you look and listen and smell and taste and feel and think about things. In other words, restraint in what comes in and restraint in what goes out. Both of these require a good amount of skill to practice. Take restraint of the senses. There's a skill to looking, a skill to listening. You want to look at things in such a way that you're not exciting greed, anger, delusion. And you want to listen to things so that you don't excite greed, anger, and delusion, and on down through the senses. And this is a skill. And it helps to have concentration as a foundation. The texts often give restraint of the senses as a prerequisite for concentration. But as is so often the case in the Buddha's teachings, the two qualities actually help each other along. Try to notice when you look at something, does your attention go flowing out? Do you lose your sense of the body? If you do, that's a sign that your, your looking isn't all that skillful. You want to be able to stay in the body as you look, as you listen. Maintain your sense of the breath, maintain your sense of breath energy throughout the body. And if you find that you can't, well, there's a sign either you're looking for the purpose of forgetting the body. In other words, you're looking for the purpose of greed, anger, and delusion. Or you're just simply careless and the sight, the smell, the sound, the smell, the taste, whatever, to happen to provoke greed, anger, delusion. And for most people, that's how they look and listen and smell and taste and feel and think about things. They forget their center, they lose their center and suddenly find themselves centered outside. And for most of, this is, most of us, this is how we get our pleasures in life, by grabbing on to a sight or a sound and then trying to elaborate on it, either in ways that make it more attractive and make it seem more meaningful than it actually is. Or if the mind is a mood for a little bit of anger, you focus on the things that would provoke the anger and then you can elaborate on it, proliferate as much as you like. Those are where our skills tend to be. If you think of input at the senses as a kind of food for the mind, and the Buddha does, that's one of his it's one of the foods for the mind that he lists in the four foods for consciousness. Contact at the senses. And then there are your intentions at the senses, exactly why you're looking at these things, listening to these things to begin with. You have to ask yourself, are you preparing good food for the mind or junk food? Or poisonous food? That's the kind of cooking that we're used to. So what you've got to do is learn how to cook for the mind in a new way. This is why we focus on the breath and try to get the mind centered inside. Because you're actually changing the level of the mind when it's inside the body. It's on the level of form all of a sudden, which is a higher level than the level of the senses. And so even though there may be some desire here, it's a skillful desire because it raises the level of the mind. You're not dependent on things outside for your happiness. You're learning how to manage what you've already got. It's like as the John Lee says, it's like learning how to grow food in your own property rather than going to invade the property of others. Learn how to develop a sense of ease, a sense of fullness and refreshment here in the body. Make that your food. And then try to preserve that, protect that level of the mind. That's the skill in how you look at things and listen to things. Maintaining the sense of the center in the body, a sense of ease and refreshment and fullness, no matter what happens outside. That puts the mind in a much better position. In this case, restraint of the senses doesn't mean you're depriving the mind, it's simply you're learning how to fix better food for the mind, nourish it in a healthier way, a way that's totally blameless. Sometimes you hear people talking about the dangers of getting attached to jhana, as if it were the big monster waiting for you on the side of the path. But the dangers of John are relatively minor. It's the dangers of the being stuck on the senses. Those are huge. When your happiness is dependent on the senses being in a certain way. On the one hand, this is how you see so much killing and stealing, illicit sex, lying, getting drunk out in the world, all the 
precepts get broken because of people's attachment to the pleasures of the senses. And you don't see anybody killing or stealing because of their attachment to jhana. So even though this is an attachment, it's a better one. And when your happiness is not dependent on things outside being a certain way, people outside have less power over you. We see this so much these days. All they have to do is wave the red flag. There's danger out there. There are terrorists out there. They can harm us. We've got to do all kinds of evil things to stop them. Well, if the only nourishment you have for the mind is things outside like that, you're going to be swayed by those arguments. But when you can step back and say, no, I've got a source of pleasure, a source of happiness inside, that people outside can't touch, then you're much less likely to be led astray. So it's for the protection of the mind that you want to be able to find your nourishment inside. And then as for the pleasures of the world outside, they hold a lot less poison because you're not trying to feed on them anymore. They're still there, but you can learn how to use them more skillfully. Again, you'll learn how to look more skillfully and listen more skillfully. And there will be times in the meditation when things aren't going as well as you'd like. And it's helpful to go out and look at the beauty of nature around you. The clouds, the sun, the sunset, the moon and the stars at night. The passages in the canon where Mahagasapa, who was probably one of the strictest and sternest of the Buddhist disciples, talks about the beauty of nature and how being in the hills, being in the mountains, being in the jungle refreshes him. Some of the first wilderness poetry in the world is in the Pali canon. Appreciation of the, the beauties of not just nature, but wild nature. It's part of the skill in learning how to gladden the mind. So what it comes down to is, as the Buddha said, even something as simple as looking or listening can be developed as a skill. You look and listen and yet try to maintain your sense of being centered inside. This is one of the best measurements for how much greed, anger, and delusion is lurking in the mind and pushing the mind around. If you catch the mind flowing out to a particular object, there you are. So many of us in the West deny that we have any defilements in the mind. People don't like the word defilement. They deny that there's anything defiled in the mind, and yet when the mind is clouded like this, that's precisely what the Buddha means. Your, your sense of awareness gets narrowed. It goes flowing out. This is, according to John Lee, these are the effluents that the Buddha is talking about. This sense, this tendency to flow out to things. So that's unskillful looking, unskillful listening. If you're skillful, you can stay inside. And when you catch the flow, Okay, you've learned an important lesson, that there is still greed, anger, delusion in the mind. If you want to look for it, here it is. And it's only when you see it that you can actually do something about it. You can begin to sense the danger of falling for those currents. And the mind develops the motivation to want to do something about it, so that you don't get pushed around like this. Again, think of being inside the form of the body as a higher level of food for the mind, a higher level of happiness. And you want to do everything you can in order to stay here, regardless of what happens outside. So when the fire comes from the east and swoops down, you want to stay right where you are. The body may move, but you want to stay inside the body. When the cold comes, when the heat comes, you want to be able to find your refreshment, your sense of well-being here in the body. When disappointments come in life, you still want to stay here, not let the disappointments from outside, especially things that other people do or things that happen in the world around you. You don't want those to make inroads in the mind. So this is why restraint of the senses is not deprivation. It's actually feeding the mind better food, giving it a higher level of pleasure, realizing that you can have everything. If you go for the more dangerous food, okay, you miss out on the, on the better food. You've got to make the choice. So in that sense, it's a deprivation, but it's actually, it's a trade. So as you go through the day, remind yourself, ask that question, what am I feeding on right now? And what is it saying about the mind? What am I learning about the mind by watching the way I feed? And this way, simply the act of looking or listening is part of the practice. It's nourishment for the practice, keeps it going. So it's not the case that you simply gain some refreshment while you sit here with your eyes closed or you're doing walking meditation. You gain refreshment throughout the day. And there's a continuity in the practice. 
trying to maintain this sense of center inside. And if you're able to do that throughout the day, when you sit down and close your eyes, you're right here. You don't have to spend the whole hour just pulling the mind in and pulling the mind in because it's already here. You're already developing the wisdom and discernment that protect the mind, keep it here. So it's not like you have to cook them up fresh every time you sit down and meditate. So think of everything you do throughout the day as being a skill. Learn to exercise restraint. Sometimes it means if there are certain things that you don't know how to deal with yet, okay, you don't look at them, you don't listen to them. But you don't have to go through life totally with blinders on all the time. You want to learn how to look at things, even things that normally might set you off. Learn how to look at them in a way that they don't set you off. It's something that you feel greed for, well, look at the unattractive side of what it would involve to gain that thing and keep it. There's lust, okay, think of the unattractive side of the body, your own and every body around you. In other words, as John Lee would say, look at things with both eyes. And furthermore, stay centered right here while you're doing your looking. So you can check and see if, as you're looking and listening, are you really staying separate from the defilement or are you sneaking in with it? Are you flowing along with it? This is why restraint is a really good check on the mind. Not only to stop it, but also to check on what's actually going on. And if the defilements seem really quiet while you're sitting here meditating, well, here's your chance to test them. Do they flow out during the rest of the day? So restraint is what provides the continuity of the practice. And if you do it skillfully, okay, then you're looking and listening all becomes part of the practice. And it keeps the practice alive throughout the day.